So, good evening. As you can see, to, tonight we're going to talk about cognitive warfare. And the challenge for you is actually for the next 40 minutes not watching your iPhone. Because it's all about this uh, tonight. So what I'm going to do is present five elements that are very important when we talk about cognitive warfare. Of course, I will not go in details, because the idea is to give you a general sense of all the problems we will have in the next 5, 10, 15 years, and I've actually already present uh, today. So the first thing is we will look at what is cognitive warfare. That will be the most theoretical part, but don't worry, there's not a lot of theory. After that, we will look at China. Why China? Because China is clearly uh, becoming the most aggressive uh, actor when we talk about cognitive warfare. It's not the only one. You probably heard about uh, Russia. But China is clearly uh, an important one. And you will also see that there are new actors that have become also uh, very important and are also very scary because they are less known than states. The third part will be about us, meaning our democracies, and why actually we are losing the war uh, of cognitive warfare, meaning information warfare, and these things. And you will see that we could actually defend ourselves, but the fact is that our democracies have become so weak that it's actually starting to be very easy for Russia, China, and others to influence uh, society. The fourth element will actually be linked to uh, information warfare, or cognitive warfare, but it's about all the new technologies, because you will see that if you want to master cognitive warfare, you need actually to have, or actually become number one in every new high-tech technology, and I will try to show you the links between cognitive warfare and these uh, new technologies. And then finally, I will just have some words on what I call Cognitive Warfare 2.0, meaning what is going to arrive in the next few years. And once again, it's not really very positive. So if you were, you were expecting something nice tonight, it's not going to be the case, okay? That's for the concert. I'm here to depress, okay? So, the fact is that at the origin, we had internet, as you know. And the idea when we were starting with internet was that social networks would bring people together. I remember when we were on Facebook, because my generation is more Facebook than TikTok and, and so on. But I remember that when we were on Facebook, the idea was, oh, Facebook is nice. It will bring culture together. We will discuss. It will be about you know, governance, cooperation, knowing each, uh, each other, and so on. Well, about 20 years later, we're clearly not in this scenario. Um, we are today in a scenario where we have more and more fake news on social networks. Can be about. The COVID, the vaccines, Canon, for some who don't know Canon, it's uh, an important group that is in conspiracy theories in the US, and it's starting to come here uh, in Europe. And of course, you have states that are very active in everything that is fake news, conspiracy theories, as Russia, China, but also others. The problem is, and I will explain that, is that instead, as I mentioned, that we are actually cooperating, that we are actually understanding each, each other, we are in a situation where actually we are more and more in a logic of polarization, of division. And here again, I will explain how cognitive warfare works. So for us, as political scientists and working on security, and is security issues, one of the challenges is how come that social networks have now become actually a security issue? 15 years ago, once again, when we had Facebook, we didn't really think about Facebook as a threat, or TikTok today, or things like that. Well, now we actually study this issue based on really um, a security issue. And one of the main problems, and here again I will come back on that, 
is what we call the deregulation of the information market. Meaning that today everyone can post something and it is considered potentially as true. So you don't really have this regulation anymore when we talk about news. Everyone can actually post something and you will have followers and the person becomes actually credible. Uh, and so for example, for us, professors at the university, we have more and more trouble to in a certain way exist because actually what we say is actually contradicted by people who don't have a clue what they're saying, but they are on Twitter and they have actually more influence than we have. And that is clearly problematic, not because I'm a professor, I don't care about that, but it's the idea that uh, uh, scientifics, people who have knowledge, actually are having problems to be heard because people are actually uh, on Twitter, Facebook, and others saying a lot of, in a certain way, crap. So the fact is that everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but not to their own facts. That is the idea. The fact is today that while everyone is always entitled to their own opinion, everyone is also entitled to their own facts. And that is the big issue, is that having an opinion, I don't care. I mean, everyone can have his, his opinion. But the fact is that more and more, it's not anymore about opinions, but it's also about the problems linked to facts. And that is clearly, as we will see, very problematic, and certainly for all democracies. So what is actually cognitive warfare? Because it's about this, of course, that I want to talk tonight. And in a certain way, to make it simple, cognitive warfare is about you. Because the target is you, and actually me. So everyone here in this um, room in this, uh, is actually the target. And the idea is that, and that is clearly something that is involving today when we talk about war issues, and I will come back when I talk about China, is that today the brain is a battle space of the 21st century. The problem is that states as Russia, China, Iran, North Korea uh, have understood that we still have problems to accept the fact that we are going to be influenced through social media. And here again, I will explain that a little bit later. So what is the definition of um, cognitive warfare? Well, there are not a lot of definitions. Why? Because I didn't mention it before, but cognitive warfare, the concept, exists since a few years. Uh, and we just are starting to work on it. Um, it's uh, about, of course, exact science are working a lot on Twitter uh, and things like that. But more and more we see also people like me on, in social uh, science who are also working uh, on cognitive warfare. And then also, of course, every military. So if you look at NATO, for example, you will see that more and more they are studying also um, cognitive warfare. So what is it? Well, it's the weaponization of public opinion by an external entity for the purpose of influencing public and governmental policy and destabilizing public institutions. That is really the objective. So when we are actually submitted uh, by cognitive warfare, that means that people are trying to influence you by saying what you should think, how you should think, and it's everyone, as I mentioned before, that is the target. So it's not only the elites, it's not only the media, it's everyone that has actually today um, an iPhone with social networks, be it TikTok, uh, Instagram, um, Facebook, and so on. I will explain that TikTok is the worst, uh, although that Twitter, now X under Elon Musk, becomes a problem. So and that was not the case before, but it's clearly changing. For the ones who have a bit knowledge of military issues, you can see that actually cognitive warfare is part of what we call hybrid warfare today. That is actually linked to economics, politics, military, asymmetric warfare, and things like that. And, and cognitive warfare is one of the, uh, the elements. But what is interesting is that cognitive warfare goes further than information warfare. You probably heard a lot of guerre de l'information, information warfare. But actually cognitive warfare goes further because information warfare was more about controlling the media. Cognitive warfare is really about controlling the brain. And of course, when 
we have a connected society as our societies, democracies, we are clearly a very easy target. Don't forget that all the social networks we have here in Belgium, the Chinese can use them, the Russians can use them, the Iranians can use them, North Koreans, whatever. We cannot do the same thing in China because Facebook, Twitter doesn't exist in China. They have their own closed system. The same thing in Russia. So open societies will clearly be more vulnerable than closed societies when we talk about cognitive warfare. That means, of course, that we do have a problem, as I will explain a little bit later. What is also interesting is that, and here again I will uh, give you some examples later, is that we do have the reflex to see cognitive warfare only coming from external forces, meaning Iran, North Korea, and so on and so on. The fact is that there is a new evolution that actually more and more political parties, uh, NGOs, and others are using cognitive warfare also. And that is clearly uh, a very problematic uh, evolution uh, because that means that many, many actors are now in this logic of influencing people. Of course, you will tell me, and I agree with you, that information manipulation is not, not, nothing new. During the Cold War, you had propaganda. We saw that, of course. But things have changed based on some elements. First of all, the speed of information and dissemination, internet uh, and social networks, the quantity of information we are exposed to, the distance that has become almost non-existent, and of course, the post-truth era. Here again, I will come back on these elements um, a little bit later, but that means that we have clearly a problem because the quantity of information, for example, that we get is not positive in the sense that the brain cannot analyze all this information. So we have clearly a problem of knowing what is a good information, what is a bad information. Just take one example. Look at what's happening between Hamas and Israel. I mean, I haven't seen so much disinformation in years. I mean, we have the Russians and so on, but coming from Hamas, coming from Palestine, the Palestinians, coming from Israel, they all are in this logic of a cognitive, what we call cognitive campaigns, meaning trying to influence. And here again, I will uh, come back on that. So that means that for many states and even non-state actors, the target, what we call also the center of gravity, is the population and the whole political process. Because the idea, in a certain way, of course, is influencing the elites, but is also influencing you, so that you will actually influence your politicians on an issue. And because you're on, on, on social networks, it will be, of course, easier than uh, that was the case in the past. Knowing also, and here again I will come back on that, we have, and we can see that with the elections we have in, in Europe, we have a very polarized Europe. Uh, look at the elections yesterday in Holland. Look at potentially what's going to happen in June 24 in our country. You have clearly a very polarized state where you have extreme left, extreme right, and then the middle that is starting to disappear. Well, that is actually a gift for all the states that want to actually uh, fragilize, uh, weaken the democracies. So more we are polarized, more actually it's easier for our, our adversaries to actually weaken our societies and also our model of democracy. And the idea is this. On one hand, when you are a target of cognitive warfare, they will try to destabilize you and influence you. What is the idea behind that? Well, in a certain way, it is saying that democracies are bad, but that actually that authoritarian regimes as China are good. Now you are going to say, well, they can always try, they will not succeed. But that would be a big error because you're looking the world from the West. But there are less and less democracies in the world. So the target is not only we, the West, but it's also Africa, Central Asia, Latin America. And if you have 
this discourse of look at democracies, how they work, how, and then what we will do is, of course, using every scandal we have in, in, uh, in our societies, they will amplify it and show, for example, to African societies that actually the West is not working well, that democracies are not working well, and look at China. And that is going to go through social networks. So they will influence uh, these different countries, these different population, through social influence. And you will see that on disabilizing and influence, when I will talk about China, I will, you give, I will give you practical examples to show you how China uh, does that in practice. And the whole issue is actually today a clash of narratives. Just look here again, Hamas, Israel. It's all about what is now the reality. Even for us, as specialists of international relations, to be, to be honest, it's very hard to know exactly what's happening on the ground, who to believe, what is the uh, truth, and so on. So even for us, it becomes hard to know exactly what's happening. And one of the reasons is that nobody waits ex anymore for the facts. If you remember a few weeks ago, there was this whole issue concerning a hospital. Was it bombarded, yes or no? We still don't have a clue. But what was interesting is that after five minutes, everyone had already an opinion. But nobody is actually waiting anymore for the facts. So that means that you have one opinion, then it's retweeted by a politician or someone else, and it becomes a sort of reality. And then the other side is starting to do the same thing, and the result is we don't have, still don't have a clue what exactly happened. A few years ago, the idea was we wait for the facts and then we react. That is finished. And I think the, the whole incident concerning the hospital was very interesting to see all the chain reaction we had on Twitter, um, where actually everyone has its own view, but actually nobody had any sense of what really happened. Okay? So that is really problematic because now the narrative is becoming more important than the facts. So, why is it so successful? Well, because our brains are actually very messy. And it's very e easy to influence through emotions, through uh, podcasts, and so on, and so on. Because we have what we call a bound of rationality. We think we are rational, we think we make decisions based on rationality, but the fact is, it's not. As you probably know, we actually think we are rational, but it's not the case. And one of the reasons, of course, is cognitive biases. That means that we are going to interpret a lot of elements based not on reality, but what, on we, what we think. Just to give you an example, here again I take the conflict between Hamas and Israel. If you are more pro-Palestinian, you will clearly believe what the Palestinians say. And the same thing if you are more pro-Israel. And that is because of how your brain works. That means that clearly you will not necessarily wait for the facts because your brain works like this. And the problem is, maybe some of you have heard of this book or even read this famous book. It is the whole issue of thinking fast and slow. There are, so Kahneman, who wrote the book, um, established that the brain has two systems. System one and system two. System one is known as fast, automatic, instinctive, emotional, and drawing hasty conclusions. System two is known as slow, slow, thoughtful, and logical. I can suppose that when we talk about Twitter, Facebook, it's clearly not system two who's working. It is actually system one who is working. We are reacting based on emotions. We are tweeting, uh, we are li uh, liking, we are um, sharing, based most of the time on emotions. And it's exactly what multinationals or, or, or even states are, of course, expecting. That we are going to react based on our emotions and not based on our rationality. And that is clearly problematic, because system two is actually less and less used when we are on social networks. And probably all of you, I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, Facebook, or whatever, but it, I can imagine that some of you liked something or tweeted something or retweeted something that afterwards they said, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done it. 
And well, once again, it's because we use system one. And these are all the biases. There are more than 175 biases that we use in a certain way that is going to influence how we react to facts. So imagine that your adversaries know all these biases. They will be, it will be very easy for them to influence based on emotions, on cognitive biases, and so on. So that is clearly problematic. Another issue is that it is not only cognitive biases on the individual level, but also on group level. So, for example, the way we choose our friends, our colleagues, will have an impact on what we believe and what we don't believe. Studies have shown, for example, that if you're on Twitter or Facebook, that you will probably b believe more easily something that was shared by a friend than something else. Why? Because here again about psych psychology. There is no rational idea to share something that is actually shared by a friend, but psychology, you will think, oh, it's shared by a friend, so I will like it or share it, uh, and so on. And that is how probably you heard of the word echo chambers um, start. That is actually groups where you will always have the same information. You will always have share the same information, meaning, for example, that if you're in logic of extreme right, the only information you got will be co come from the same people who think like you. And of course, that is problematic, because more you stay in your bubble, less you will be open to new arguments, to different arguments. And that is what we see more and more on Twitter, for example, uh, on Facebook, but clearly more on Twitter, where we see that, and even politicians, very interesting, if you follow some Belgian politicians, they are completely in their bubbles. Uh, it's very interesting to see that they will only share what the same group is saying. So every, and if there is a counter argument, they will ignore you or block you. Well, that is typical, what we call an echo chamber, meaning I am very happy if you confirm what I think, and I will dislike if you are not agreeing with me. And here again, social networks are very interesting. Studies have also shown that we have the concept of homophily, a very interesting concept, because it's at the root of invisible social boundaries. These boundaries homogenize your relational environment, reducing the diversity of information to which you are exposed and constraining the attitudes, habits, and values you are likely to adopt, as well as the experiences you are likely to have. Well, what has been shown concerning social networks is that when you are on social networks, it's about value homophily and not status homophily, meaning that people that you sh uh, where you share your, uh, your vision and so on, well, these are people that share your same values in the logic of extreme right, extreme left, uh, and so on. So there is a big difference between, in a certain way, your social life, let's say here tonight, and the one on uh, social networks, where actually it's all about values, ideology, so also, of course, emotions. And that is, here again, a way to manipulate uh, the human uh, brains. So. Relying on human cognitive flaws, but also, and that is something we don't like to hear, but I will say it, or intellectual laziness, which consists of in not exercising or crit critical thinking systematically, manipulating information through the information of our environments becomes easier. Why? Because we don't even take the time to actually look at the facts and wait if the facts are really true. And that is more and more facilitated through micro-targeting and what we call behavioral data. Uh, and I will come back on data, but everything you do on your iPhone, that means data. And that means that more you are on, on, the, on these uh, social networks, more they know about you, and more they will know what you like, what you dislike, and so on. And this is all linked to, of course, information, uh, where we see one big issue is that the information is less and less structured. You have a traditional media in decline, multiplication of self-producing content, and here again think about influencers, for example, and the logic also from media through, from what we call clickbait. If you look today at 
La Libre, Le Soir, uh, The Standard, The Morgan, whatever, you will see that you see more and more articles on Twitter that actually you would never have seen 15 years ago. And the only idea for, of these articles is clicking. So here again, we have clearly uh, a problem, and we have also a problem of not checking uh, the information. And everything, as I mentioned, is about uh, content uh, and emotion. What is interesting, studies have shown that if you have a message uh, that is accompanied by an image with bright colors or a video playing on the emotion, well, clearly it will influence you more than just the text. So studies have shown that if you write something on Twitter, you will have some influence, but not a lot. If you put a podcast or emotions on it, then you will see that you will have a lot of likes, a lot of shares, and so on. We'll go a little bit further. But the idea is that, as one professor at ULB says, everyone today feels authorized to use their common sense and their feeling to say what is appropriate to think about this or that scientific issue. This creates quite a nice cacophony, but nuance requires time that no one has anymore. And that is clearly the issue. So at the origin, you remember what I was talking about Facebook. That was the idea. That's where we are. And we should not be very proud about it. Because actually, we become more and more stupid. And here again, I will explain with TikTok why. That brings me to the second point, China. Here again, I will not go in too much detail, but the Chinese clearly have understood how you do cognitive warfare. The same thing for the Russians, but I think China is more interesting because they have more means, more capacities, and they learn very rapidly. It's as the case with the Russians. So the Chinese case, is clearly uh, more interesting in the long term. So the first of things is that the Chinese do not differentiate war and peace. They are what in what we call continuous logic of competition. We in the West, we actually divide this idea of war and peace. If I'm telling tonight that China is already at war with us, you will probably laugh. And the reason is that for us, war is tanks, soldiers, and things like that. For the Chinese and other states, it's not about the military as we know it. It is already about a lot of other issues. And so they see war in a very large logic as we see war as pure tanks and things like that. So that's a big difference because that means that their logic is completely different than ours. And we have this tendency of mirror imaging, meaning that we always think that the other acts as we do. So because we don't see really a danger, we estimate that the danger will not come from states as China or Russia. Well, here again, it's not the case. So cognitive warfare has been very present since uh, more than 10 years in China. I will not bother you with all these elements, but what is interesting is that it started in 2013 with different documents, and they have become better and better and better. So they are clearly uh, evolving, um, and that is also problematic because now they have con they developed a new concept that they call the intelligence warfare, and that's, you hear it's about warfare, as you can hear, and it's really about cognitive warfare, meaning how are they going to be able to weaken our democracies? And it's a real strategy. So it's, nothing, it's not something that has been just there without a logic. No, it, there is a clear logic. And that's what I'm going to explain in a few, uh, with a few PowerPoints. Maybe you heard of the concept of wolf warriors. Wolf warriors are diplomats, Chinese diplomats, most of the time ambassadors, who are very aggressive on Twitter. And it is based on a movie that was done by the Chinese wolf warrior, 
That was, uh, I think, a few years ago. And it's a little bit the Rambo of the Chinese, okay? 30, 40 years later. But the idea is China is back and we are going to be more and more aggressive. Now, for example, concerning the war in Ukraine, as you know, officially, they are not engaged. Well, officially, they are actually very present. So if you look at the Twitter of the Chinese embassy in Kenya, or the one, uh, the, the Facebook uh, in South Africa, you will see a lot of nice pictures. It's all about to show the influence, how China is wonderful, how China is working with the Africans, and how beautiful everything is. And then you have the uh, war warriors, the diplomats, who actually will do everything to destroy, for example, in Africa, NATO, Europe, and the US. So you have this idea of influence on one side and destabilizing on the other side. And so you have many ambassadors who will be very aggressive to try to influence, in this case, African populations. To give you another example, to, to show you how subtle they can be, Maybe you heard that the Americans were accused that they had biolabs in Ukraine. It was pure crap invented by the Russians to actually try to divide NATO, Europe, and so on. But the story was taken by the Chinese, not a lot in Europe, but in Africa. And what they did is very smart. On this uh, picture, you don't see a Chinese expert you see actually an American scholar who confirms the idea of biolabs. Why is that so smart? Because if, of course, if I put there a Chinese scholar, you will think about propaganda. If you put an American scholar, then it should be true. You look, the Chinese are saying it is based not on we Chinese, it is an American who says it. The guy was crap. But here again, it works. So just to show you how subtle these things can be. And concerning the war in Ukraine, they have been very, very active. So what we, as you know, we've uh, closed Sputnik, Russia today, and so on. But the fact is that it's only in Europe. So in, uh, in all the other region, Russia today, Sputnik is still working. And the Chinese have not been sanctioned. So what they do is taking over the fake news, conspiracy theories from the Russians, and then use them by the, through their own social networks in Africa, Central Asia, and so on. So what we did actually didn't have a lot of uh, consequences because they were able to continue to disinform. And the idea behind that is, once again, as I mentioned, to, in a certain way, destabilize our societies and show that actually authoritarian regimes are stronger than democracies. So more we are weaker, more we are divided, more they can sell the story of saying, hey, you see, Europe is weak. Look at democracies, doesn't work. But look at China, 40 years, years of economic growth, stability, what would you prefer? And that is clearly working in uh, different uh, states in the region, meaning that we have clearly an, an opposition today between authoritarian regimes and the uh, democratic regimes. And the, real, the, the way we have this fight is also through cognitive warfare, with the idea to really influence elites, but also the whole populations. I will go a little bit further. Just to explain you that here I took the example of China. But the fact is there are more and more other states who are doing the same thing. Russia, as I mentioned, but also North Korea, Iran, and here again, as I mentioned, Israel, Hamas, and so on. The problem is, maybe you heard of this story. It was published in Le Monde a few weeks ago, actually months ago. This is Team Jorge. And no, they are not Spanish, they're actually Israel, coming from Israel. Well, this was a company who was paid by African leaders to influence the elections in different com uh, states in Africa. So the fact is now that you can pay actually societies today 
to influence and to start a campaign, called, uh, what we call a cognitive campaign, for influencing uh, elections in uh, Africa, for example. We had, of course, Cambridge uh, Analytica with the whole Trump issue in 2016. Um, but uh, clearly, what we see more and more is also, as I mentioned, non-state actors. And that is also becoming a problem. And as I mentioned in my introduction, what is more worrying, actually, for us is that even political parties are now in this logic of cognitive warfare. If you look, look at the Twitter, and here again, you can take all the political parties, they are clearly in a logic also of influencing, not on facts anymore, but on emotions, and so on and so on. And the idea is really uh, clearly in a logic of division. So as you can see, the threat has become, comes from the external states, non-state actors, but also more and more from uh, our own uh, nations. And then just a few words on TikTok, uh, TikTok before going on, uh, on the, the three different, uh, different uh, questions that are left. TikTok is really problematic. Because of the algorithm and the whole issue of doom scrolling. I don't know if you have, it's a young public, but too old to be really on, Twitter, uh, on TikTok every day. But maybe you have children who are on TikTok every day. Well, we do see more and more, and there are more and more studies that show that there are problems of mental health. So we had the generation, for example, as professor, I, am, I have known the generation who is actually on Instagram, uh, and the new one who is starting to arrive in the first year will be the ones on TikTok. Well, what we see for, since a few years is problem of concentration, problems of uh, critical thinking, and, and TikTok is actually worse than everything we saw. Because the algorithm is so strong that actually what's happening is that young people are able to scroll almost the whole day. And they will get the information that they want. So it has become a real problem. I'm talking about TikTok as the digital fentanyl. If you know what is fentanyl, you will know that 100,000 people in the US die every year. Uh, concerning this drug. And clearly, TikTok is dangerous. As you know, TikTok is Chinese, and they have the same app that is Douyin in China. So the same thing, but not really the same thing. Because what TikTok does, Douyin does not really the same thing. And what is very problematic is that we allow our children to be on TikTok, but the fact is that more these kids are on TikTok, less they will play soccer, or tennis, or dance, less they will study. So making people, yes, I apologize to say that, stupid. The Chinese realized that TikTok, so doing could become an, an issue, so they have stated that children under 14 years old cannot go more than 40 minutes on TikTok every day. So they clearly realize the danger, but we do not. So we have still no real uh, regulation concerning TikTok when it's, when it's about our kids. And you will see that the effects are dramatic. Uh, we already, say, as I mentioned, we already start to see the uh, effects of TikTok, uh, and that is clearly very worrying. Of course, X becomes also an issue. The only difference is that X is more of adults, I'm not saying it's less dangerous, but the impact will be less than on children, uh, clearly in the long term. So why are democracies losing? That's the third part. Well, first of all, less and less democracies in the world. So today, there's only about 8% states that are considered are real democracies. And if you take democracies in the broad sense, you have 50% democracies in the world and 50% authoritarian regimes. 15 years ago, it was actually a lot more democracies and less authoritarian regimes. So the whole thing has changed. Another issue why we have problem is the whole issue of post-truth era. Here you have a definition, but the idea of post-truth era is actually saying that everyone is right. 
So if I'm talking tomorrow about, let's say, I'm studying since more than 30 years, 20 years, US-China-Russia relations, I'm supposed to have some legitimacy. Well, that is finished. I can ask this person to come here, and actually, he will be as credible as I am. That is what we call the post-truth era, meaning that everything that was considered as scientific, as uh, where you study things and so on, has been questioned. And that means, of course, that everyone has now the right to speak about everything. And if you put a little bit of emotion on that, then you can be sure that you will win the debate. So it's really clearly problematic because there, there's no hierarchy of knowledge anymore. And that is certainly as a professor of university, very problematic. Because as you know, we study for many, many years issues um, in social science, exact science, and then you have people who don't have a clue what they're saying, but actually are more credible than uh, universities or things like that. And that is clearly very problematic, and also very problematic because that is, uh, is a scholar who said that we are actually particip participative propagandists. Why? Because by liking and sharing, we actually reinforce these people. And that is, of course, here again, problematic. So goodbye to nuance, critical thinking, and expertise. And we see that more and more, even in political science, who is actually less important than exact science, in the sense that we have less influence in the world than exact science. But the fact is that we see more and more also people, uh, I mean, uh, if you look here again, Israel, Palestine, I don't work on this issue. So you will not find one tweet concerning this issue. But what I was surprised is I haven't, I've haven't, never seen so many experts on the issue. I thought there were four or five in Belgium. Actually, there are hundreds, even thousands of people who now have a knowledge about the conflict. How they did it, I don't know. I mean, they, did, they probably learned that in one day, two days. The specialists at our university, they studied this whole issue for more than 30, 40 years. But here again, we have a problem. And as Umberto Eco says, the networks have given the right to speak to legions of idiots who used to speak only at the bar, after a glass of wine, and did not harm to, to the community. They were immediately silenced, whereas today they have the same right to speak as a Nobel Prize winner, is the invasion of the imbeciles. And to be honest with you, it's a little bit true. And then finally, we have polarization. I will not come back, but the fact is that more and more we are in the logic of communitarism, populism, meaning that, and we see that with political parties even in Belgium, we don't even talk uh, uh, to each other anymore. It's more yelling. And if you go on Twitter, you have some of these political parties who are very good in it, actually presidents of political parties, who are very good in these things, where actually they will react on everything. But uh, if, you, if you look really on what is behind, uh, be behind these tweets, there is actually nothing. So we have created a perfect environment uh, for interference. As, as Sun Tzu said, the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself, meaning us. Fourth point, and here again I will not go in details, but I was talking about cognitive warfare. But actually, there is also a part that is very important, that is the invisible part of cognitive warfare. And here again, you will see I have a lot of slides, but the idea is just to show you how complex things are. Because, as I mentioned, cognitive warfare becomes an issue. But if you want to become very good in it, you need artificial intelligence to produce more and more fake news. So, States will invest more and more also in artificial intelligence for cognitive warfare. And then you need also algorithms, because artificial intelligence work with algorithms. So you need to create algorithms. That means that we will have a lot of investments in STEM, so science, technology, and so on, um, research and development. But that means also that you need data. And data is exactly what you're doing every day when you're on your iPhones, is giving data. And more the adversary has data on you, more they will be able to target you on different issues, because more and more they will know you. And it's not finished, because all of this 
necessitates supercomputers. That's okay, but what is more interesting in the future is quantum computers. Because they will be able to produce faster, better uh, fake news. And then, of course, if you have data going from one side to the other, so if you send a tweeter, don't think it's that easy, because it goes through satellites, submarine cables, or 5G and 6G. So the whole investments in these domains are also important when we talk about cognitive warfare. Because if you con uh, control the satellites, if you control the submarine cables, you will have an advantage where the data is going and where it will uh, target. And no, it's not, still not finished, because everything I said, iPhones, algorithms, computers, artificial intelligence, need semiconductors. And if you have been following the news, there is a big fight between the Americans, the Europeans, and the Chinese on these little things. So here again, without semiconductors, you will not be able to be number one in cognitive warfare. And no, it's not finished. Because all these things use a lot of energy. And that means you will have to invest in renewables. But renewables is also about resources. Because green energy uh, is a lot about resources, and high tech is about resources. So that means that we will see more and more fighting in Africa and Central Asia and Latin America because of lithium, cobalt, coltan, copper, because Internet of Things, because of green energy, and so on and so on. And it's also about norms, international norms. Who is going to establish the norm of social networks? Who is going to establish norms of, uh, for example, metaverse, which, which I will just mention in a few seconds, and so on and so on. So here again, we have all these uh, stakes. You have also cyber, because of everything goes through, of course, computers, infrastructures, and so on. And it's also linked to the whole fourth industrial revolution. So what I mean by that is that if you study cognitive warfare only through the eyes of information warfare, uh, cognitive warfare, as I mentioned, you will actually miss a lot of things. It's also about climate change and so on and so on. So you can see that when we talk about cognitive warfare, you have to link that to all the other issues because they will have an impact on social networks. And finally, very shortly, what is going to be the future? Well, the future, once again, be depressed. It's not going to be very positive. We have already deep fakes. We have all artificial intelligence powered by Bing image creator. So it's not if it's the fake one. And we have, of course, ChatGPT, who makes fake news also easier. Neuroscience, uh, think about Neuralink with Elon Musk, but more and more the Chinese actually are investing a lot, a lot, a lot in neuroscience uh, to influence also how we think. The idea in the future would be actually to have an implant and here I'm talking, it's not science fiction, and the idea that Chinese are already thinking about that, to have implants in your brains so that the, you will be determined to how to think, why, how, uh, what you think, and so on and so on. We're still not there, but they are investing more and more in these uh, logics. You have hygiene also, who was, that's one of the latest ones, uh, probably you saw that you are able to translate everything in the same language. So you're speaking, and actually you speak uh, Italian, or you speak Chinese, or Spanish, or whatever. And here again, that will also have an impact on cognitive warfare. And the last one is metaverse. Metaverse could become an issue, because everything I said that we see today could also evolve in uh, the metaverse. For example, we already have cases of harassment in the metaverse. So these are things that clearly become an issue. And in the future, you could have actually states that will invest in the metaverse to influence people who are actually playing on the meta in the metaverse. So imagine here again that that will be problematic because also the danger of metaverse is that more you will be on the metaverse, less you will have actually real social connections. 
So that means that you could become very influential. That is still fiction, but becomes more and more a problem. The only thing that is positive in certain sense is that metaverse today is not that famous in the sense that uh, probably um, Meta, so the or former Facebook, was probably convinced that metaverse would become a real, real uh, big new thing. It's still not the case. So that is, in certain way, the positive thing uh, of all this. What is also interesting is that uh, when we talk about metaverse, all the big players in the US and in China are already on the metaverse. So here again, you have this competition between US and China when we talk about this new fictional world. Conclusion of all this. Well, if you want to change a system, you have to change how people behave. And to do that, you must first change how they think. And it's exactly, exactly what cognitive warfare is. It's clearly also a long-term approach. And the Chinese are very good in long-term policies. So they can wait if they need. For example, I didn't mention it, but if you look at what's happening in Taiwan, they have been very, very aggressive concerning cognitive warfare. Every day, there are attacks on the, the Taiwanese population concerning fake news and things like that. And the idea is actually to divide and polarize the Taiwanese society so that if there is war tomorrow, the Taiwanese society will not fight. That would be the objective. But of course, it's a long-term objective because it takes time. Concerning we, the West, Belgium, well, we should pr pr uh, put our own house in order. It's a real mess. So we need to rethink our democracies. We need really to think about how uh, we communicate, how um, we can evolve uh, concerning democracies. And what is really dangerous is this, is the fact that um, social connections are disappearing. So less and less people are actually talking together. Uh, and we see that, uh, once again, with political parties. Uh, when I was saying they are really, uh, actually yelling at each other, it's really this. Uh, you don't have really d real discussions about issues. I mean, it, when it's about climate change, for example, everyone has his own position, but nobody's trying to say, OK, I like your idea, but think about my idea. Maybe we can have a real uh, policy concerning, for example, green energy. So finally, we need to, to know our adversary. We need to evolve to what we call more and more cognitive resilience. That is mean protecting our brain. Uh, in Chile, there was a, an idea to put an article in the Constitution. Uh, I think it was in Chile, but it was clearly in an American, a Latin American state, to put actually this idea of protecting the brain in the Constitution. So just to show you how uh, problematic it has become. And the approach has to be holistic. I have been talking about social science, but the whole part on exact science is, of course, very important. And that is actually studying the data, the tweets, who is uh, sharing, how is this shared, and things like that. My job is more on the right side of this uh, figure. If we don't do that, that's going to be the result. That means the wall, meaning that we will lose. And don't ever forget, if you are not paying for the product, you are the product. And of course, you probably heard of this. It's a very fam famous quote. So thank you for your attention. And if you're interested, these are three interesting, interesting books. Of course, you have 1984. You have Brave New World. But the one maybe you don't know, and it's a very small book, but honestly, I really uh, encourage you to, to read it, is The Machine Stops, written in 1908. And what is interesting is that if you read the book, you have the impression that we are in 2023. It's a very, very uh, interesting book. Because 1984, everyone knows the story. Most of you know Brave New World. But The Machine Stops is actually, for me, the best of the three. Okay? So thank you for your attention.